I just concluded another riveting conversation with my friend Doug Thornton on his podcast, American Vindicta. We continued our discussion about UFOs and aliens, this time with a focus on alien abductions. And I wanted to share this video on my channel as well, so those of you who watched the first part could also watch the second. But first, I want to remind you of my upcoming Birthright Conference that will be taking place from the 6th through the 7th of May in Nashville, Tennessee. The conference will feature topics related to transhumanism, aliens, UFOs, and Bible prophecy. This is going to be a very exciting event, and I'm happy to announce that you can now get $40 off your conference tickets by applying the promo code BRANDON, in all caps, at checkout. You can go to birthrightconference.com to get your tickets or follow the link in the description below this video. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Doug. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Vindicta Show. This is the special called America's Most Unexplained, and we are still on the topic of UFOs today. We're actually talking about alien abductions, and we have a very controversial uh, figure on with us today, uh, Tim Alberino. Many of you should be aware of him. And uh, before we go to Tim, I just want you, everyone to know that uh, your sponsorship and your donations are what helps to make this show grow, and it's what helps to get us great guests like Tim. And uh, currently, it is posted on the website, the P.O. Box, uh, for the American Vindicta show is up. So many of you have been requesting it. So that's where you can find it. Uh, we're pressed for time. So we're just going to get straight into it. Tim, thank you for being on today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, alien abductions. Now you have a very controversial, different outlook when it talks, when we talk about alien abductions. Now, when we talk about aliens in general, I would yeah, say. Yeah, when we talk about aliens in general, look, here's my here's my whole spiel about this. I'm a student of this. I'm a fan of this. I don't know everything, so I want to learn, right? And I want to hit as many different aspects as possible. And so do most of the people who are listening. I think it's wrong for everyone, in my opinion, to be in a very narrow-minded train of thought. When we talk about something we cannot really uh, take into in, in an investigatory uh, file and then just open it up and, and see evidence, all right? Aliens, the abductions, a lot of it's firsthand, secondhand, thirdhand, key witness testimonies. There are some things uh, left over in the bodies like chips or, or debris. You know, there's a there's a lot within this field, within this topic about abductions. I don't think anyone has it really uh, panned out i don't think everyone really has their thumb on it but i know you have probably one of the most controversial and most interesting outlooks and theories on the abductions and uh without further ado man take it away well um that's probably true i mean in terms of within within let's say the christian community my perspective on the alien question uh is is different than than the um, than the conventional view, let's say. Um, however, I will say that my view, and I said this last time on your program, uh, the, the the last time we talked about aliens and UFOs, um, my view actually is in sync with the old school ufologists with with the researchers that that kicked this field off and th this field being the field of ufology which has now been completely validated and vindicated with the government's with the government's uh admission that ufos and now alien abductions are in fact real they're happening um and so uh, I defer to the people who I believe are the experts or were the exp experts uh, in the field of ufology and specifically alien abduction. And when I say expert, I mean, this is a field of research and investigation. It's not really a field. It's not, it's not really an arena of speculation. It lends itself 
alien abductions, that is, lends itself to scientific inquiry. And it, and it, it has all of the evidence uh, necessary to do, to conduct a scientific investigation. Every kind of evidence that you would ever need to draw uh, conclusions, uh, whatever conclusions may be found through the data. And I defer, as I said, to the investigators who devoted their lives to doing this. And, and the ones that, uh, my favorite investigators, uh, they, they, they don't have a dog in the hunt. They're not coming from any particular world view. They're interested in the data. And they're very scientific mind, scientifically minded. That is, they are true investigators. Um, uh, and three of those individuals have passed away. Bud Hopkins, uh, John Mack, Carla Turner. And one of those individuals is still alive, David Jacobs. And there have been other researchers whose works I have read or whose lectures I have watched who I admire and respect. But those four people that I just named really are the bedrock of abduction research. And abduction research has not changed. In fact, I would say to some extent it has, it's been concluded. Today, sadly, I know of no abduction researchers, and I'm certainly not one myself of this caliber, uh, who can match the dedication and the intelligence and, and the, the quality of research that was conducted by the individuals I just named. And all of those individuals were, were highly intelligent. Three of them had doctorates in, in various fields. And, uh, and uh, two of them were professors. So actually three of them are professors. And so th those are the purple people. I'm sorry, those are not the purple people. <laughs> those are the people to whom I defer as it pertains to the abduction phenomenon. Now, I've talked to abductees myself. I've learned their craft, those researchers. I understand their conclusions based on the data that they have gathered, mountains of data. Can I ask you something on that? As a, uh, as a law enforcement professional, when we do any type of field investigations, we always base off of the who, what, where, why, when, and how. And, you know, always uh, trying to find and poke the holes into most of the, I guess you could say, uh, explanations that were given. Now, I, and I've, I've done explanation or I've done my own little investigations or, or talked to people who've seen stuff, who've come into the office and, you know, hey, I got an alien in my backyard and we have to sit here, you know, we have to uh, probe this person's mind and try and figure out, are they crazy? Are they on hallucinogenic drugs? So as law enforcement, I have a form of methodology for how I would question somebody. Uh, would the founders of this for the abduction uh, investigations, do they have a form of methodology that is obviously it's sound, you know, it's, it's doctoral based, uh, but is their methodology still concurrent and accurate compared to what's happening today? Or yes, it's, it yeah, it's it, it, when you interview an abductee, which I have done on, on various occasions, when you interview an abductee, if you are not prepared for the, the intentional misinformation and I'm trying to think of the, the, not on the part of the abductee, by the way, the misinformation that is being conveyed through the abductee from the aliens, the illusion. from these entities is what I'm talking about. Not that the abductees are trying to convey misinformation, the ones that are honest. Um, and when you have to deal with the distorted perception, remember we talked about perception last time, when you have to deal with the per distorted, per distorted perception, uh, screen memories, virtual reality scenarios, which we discussed last time. You have to be prepared for those things to show up in a conversation with an abductee. If you're not, then you're going to walk away with the wrong impressions. 
and the wrong information. Uh, and, and, and abduction researchers who are versed in these things, um, they, they, they know how to navigate through the screen memory. They know how to navigate around uh, the confabulation, the false so, memories, so, and so forth that go, are going go, to be recalled inevitably by the abductee. Go on that a little bit, uh, the screen memory. What is it that you mean by that? A screen memory is a false memory that is implanted in the mind of the abductee so that when, if the abductee is questioned or becomes curious about an abduction episode, an abduction event, rather than recall the, the actual occurrence, the details of the actual occurrence of their abduction experience, what happens is there's a firewall that's installed in their mind by the grades so that when they go to access those memories, they get instead, they're presented with false memories, screen memories. That's why they're called screen memories. The, 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 um, the purpose of a screen memory is to screen off a particular real memory and, and present you with a false memory to throw you off the trail. And um, for example, I use this example a lot because it's very common. Um, somebody might be followed by a, as they're driving down the highway, usually in a rural area at nighttime, I'm driving down the road and they suddenly notice that there's lights behind them, but the lights are sort of uh, uh, high up in the air behind them, elevated higher than a, than a motor vehicle. And the lights are, are following them. And then they realize that the lights are kind of pursuing them. And then the next thing that they know, you know, they've stopped the car. And sometimes they recall a deer coming up to the car or, or some kind of an animal. And they're staring at this animal. And then the next thing that they remember, they are driving down the road again. But now, now they're 10 miles down the road and they look at their clock and they realize that it's an hour and 45 minutes later. Okay. So missing times. So you have missing time there, but then you also have like the, the deer would be part of a screen memory. Oh, I remember I turned off my car and, and I was, there was this deer just standing there staring at me and they might have some other, memories associated with that, some bizarre things. And, and that sort of, that concludes th their memory. That's all the information that they can consciously recall. It's not that the memories aren't there. It's that there's a firewall that's blocking them from accessing the memories of the actual occurrence of the abduction episode. And if you don't know that when you're talking to somebody who's been abducted or had any kind of encounter with a gray or with a hybrid, then you're likely going to get distorted information. It may contain bits and pieces of the, what actually occurred, but overall, you're going to get a very distorted picture of the event. And you have to know that going in. And if you, and if you know, um, that you're likely going to be presented with screen memories as you talk to an abductee, you can get around, you, you can circumvent the screen memories. Now, the easiest way, and I've never done this, never had it done to me and I've never done it, but, but uh, it's, it's, been pr it's a proven technique. The easiest way, I should say the most efficient way, not the easiest, the most efficient way to, to circumvent a screen, screen memory is through what's called hypnotic uh, I just, I just lost it. It's, uh, um, I just lost it. It's, uh, it's, uh, I want to say hypnotic reduction, but it's not reduction. Anyway, it'll come to me at some point here in the conversation. Um, um, it's basically through a very mild form of hypnosis. It's basically just a, 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 a procedure by which the abductee is encouraged to relax their body and their mind. Because when you begin to recall an abduction, what happens is not only do the details 
uh, of the event surface in the mind of the abductee, but all the emotions associated with that memory also surface. And those emotions are usually terror and anger right. sometimes, anger, terror, confusion. And, and, the, and abductees often relive those emotions in real time. And sometimes, you know, and there's videos of this, uh, uh, Bud Hopkins recorded some of his sessions and uh, David Jacobs and others um, where, where people actually will, will scream and, 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 and will cower in fear uh, and will begin to relive the, the true events of what occurred uh, during a particular abduction episode, hypnotic regression. Right. <laughs> Not re reduction. That's the word that kept wanting to, to surface in my mind. Hypnotic regression is the term. Okay. And so, and what that means is, is, is just, again, it just puts people in a very uh, calm state of mind. It's not like, you know, uh, it's not like holding up a pocket watch and, and swinging it back and forth and, and, and convincing somebody that they're a chicken or something like we've all seen um, hypnotists do on stage. Nothing like that. It's, it's really just a technique to, to allow people to relax and um, basically preparing their mind to circumvent the screen memory and deal with the reality behind it. And, and because screen memories are so effective because they make use of trauma. Right. And trauma, extreme trauma, has the, the ability, and this is well known to, psycho to, psycho to psychiatrists, um, um, that screen, uh, I'm sorry, that trauma has the ability to splinter a person's personality or to sequester certain parts of a person's memories uh, uh, or a personality traits associated with those memories to even in extreme cases to, uh, to divide the mind into multiple personalities. Yes, and, and I want to add to that. All right. Russ Dizdar, uh, I think, is probably one of, one, uh, was one of the leading experts on the uh, the shattered uh, mind of these multiple personality types of people. And him based off of law enforcement, me based off of law enforcement and, and hearing what you say, uh, I have interviewed people before with these multiple personalities I've had interviewed people before that clearly have psychosis that are clearly on some sort of narcotic and they're either going through the high or they're coming down from the high. And I have noticed uh, for many years of doing this, when people start to lie, they will speed up the conversation. There will be a little bit of uh, anxiety within their voice because the mind is working to create scenarios that were no that were never there. However, when you talk to someone who has been brutalized, someone who's been, uh, you know, who's been robbed, someone who's been hit by a car, uh, someone who's gone through, uh, you know, any type of really uh, aggressive attack. And I've interviewed plenty of these people. It's a slow down. Well, this happened to me and they take time to explain. And what they'll do is they use audio and visual, uh, within the realms of use of force. I was a use of force instructor. When we would interview cops, we would say, what'd you hear? What'd you see? What'd you smell? Could you taste anything in the air like gasoline? You know, give us the full breakdown of the theater, of the environment. Let's paint the entire picture. And I would love to be able to sit there and watch the, I guess you could say the mannerisms of an abductee because then I would want to see what is triggering in their mind? Are they are they pulling from a memory based off of something they heard in a background while laying flat? You know, are they shielding their eyes? Are they you know touching parts of their face or their hands or their or their, uh, their body based off of something that was happening? Because when people go to recall incidents like what we would do with within the realms of law enforcement, that's the exact same type of. Uh, thing that we would notice that we would pick up on, especially people that have been uh, victimized sexually, you will see all those different traits and mannerisms. So I wonder, does that carry over now with the abductees? Are you seeing or have researched the same thing with these people? 
Well, I mean, certainly, as I said, when you begin to penetrate into the real memories, behind the screen memories, what you get is an eruption of emotion. People, most, many people will be overcome with fear as they begin to recall. Um, and, and anger, as I said, and, and, and many times people will just break down and cry as they are beginning to realize that, in fact, it wasn't a dare. It was a little gray guy with black eyes, and, 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 and there were three of them. And they opened the door, my car door opened, and they grabbed me by the hand, and they led me, you know, you, across the street. Usually, actually, in those kind of scenarios, the entire car is just, is just uh, um, levitated up into the air through a beam of light and into the craft. Do they stop? And then, the, and then, do they stop the car? Yeah, uh, uh, no, the abductee will stop the car. See, oh, because as we said before, that the grays can control not only your perception; uh, they have the power to manipulate to, to deactivate you, for lack of a better term. Uh, uh, grays, and, and probably likely some of the other entities as well. But let's just let's talk specifically about the grays. The, the, the grays, if you are, I was just talking to Ellie Marsuli the other day. Uh, um, on a, uh, on a Zoom call, re recorded Zoom call, and we were. I was. I used this scenario because it, I've I've read it a few times in, in a diff in a few different uh, uh, different occasions, but but very similar scenarios. Um, let's say that that you and a group of friends are uh, renting a cabin in the woods, you know, over Fourth of July weekend or something, and and you guys are all, you know watching TV or something and, and, and just, just having a good time playing darts or something like that. And the grays come to abduct somebody in that environment. So one of those people is an abductee. Well, the grays are not going to wait until that person is alone because they have the capability to show up and deactivate everybody in the room. And what that means is people are, are, are put into a state of, of, of stupor. Um, uh, LA likes to call it UFO brain fog, which is actually, actually a really good description. They, 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 they are comatose. And that doesn't mean that they fall down on the ground and pass out. They're just standing there with blank faces. They've been turned off psychologically, mentally. They've just been switched off. Like a deer in the and, headlights. Exactly. And then the grays come in and they grab the abductee, not forcibly. The abductee is very, um, I'm not going to say willing, not willing, certainly not willing, but, but uh, unable to resist its forced compliance because their motor skills and, and their, their conscious mind are, 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 are being hijacked. And so they just, they're also in a, in a, in a stupor um, and, and they, you know, the, the, the little gray guys will come in and they'll grab the abductees by the hand gently. Usually this isn't this isn't like a bunch of, you know, military guys breaking into the room and fatigues and, and throwing a bag over your head. That's not what alien abductions are. That's what my labs are, military abductions. That's how those happen. But not not alien abductions. And I'm not trying to make the case that the grays are, are good, are good and kind. They're not. They're just they don't need to do that. See, they're deploying a level of technology that that incapacitates you. That's the word. People become incapacitated. Now, the abductee usually knows what's going on. The others don't. The others just blank out. And, uh, and then the abductee is taken right from that environment, right from that environment. And or, or you, I mean, the grace, I believe, and I can't prove this, and I, and I, and, and I don't know if there's a case like this, but it's, it would seem to me that the grays have a cap have the capability to land or to to hover over a, a concert and deactivate everybody at the concert to grab one or two abductees and leave and then bring them back and then turn everybody back on now of course they wouldn't do that because there's cameras and there's there's you know it's not a it's not a an environment conducive to an abduction but a house full of people is no problem for the grays um and so this is not magic. This is not supernaturalism. This is 
mind-blowingly advanced technology that appears as magic to us. It looks like magic because it's so advanced. Let me ask you this uh, question. Have- Let me ask you this question because you, you talked about the concert. Now, that is something that we would do. Because in the middle of a distraction while it's dark and there's fog machines and people are, you know, dancing to techno music, it's too easy to take you. It's too easy. It, well, it, the greys don't even need to do that. They, they don't need a distraction. Yeah, no, but for, for us as humans, it's too easy for us to do that. But what I've, from my research, so, and, and tell me if I'm wrong or not, for my research on this abduction thing is that they do it in very sanitized environments. By sanitized, we mean that they, it always appears to happen in places where there's not a camera that's watching them. There's not, uh, you know, the dogs to bark. There's not the neighbors to see it. Uh, you know, even like your example. What I find interesting about this detail is that if you're in this secluded cabin in the woods, here come the grays. For one thing, nobody around is seeing the craft. We already know why. You've already explained to us within the the first uh, interview that they have the ability to cloak themselves to an extent. But what about the slowing down of the time to get through the door and freeze everybody more or less? Well, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, if the craft is in proximity, see, an an abduction happens differently based on whether or not the craft is in proximity. So if the craft is hovering over the house, let's say, let's, let's return to that cabin. The craft is hovering over that cabin. Then the, then the grays can pull you right through the window. And you're caught in that time warp bubble more or less, right? uh, Yes. That's probably true. you you are in, you are within that, that a gravity distortion field where time is likely moving at a different pace. Um, and so that could account for a lot of things. Um, pilots, we now know based on the Pentagon's own, ad, own admission that pilots who get, who come into close proximity as they are, uh, as they are trying to, uh, to catch these advanced aerospace vehicles as they're trying to, to, um, to, to make visual contact, let's say, and get close enough to make visual contact. Some of these pilot, pilots experience what's called time dilation. There's, there, it's not necessarily missing time. It's, it's a warping of time. Missing time is like, like I said, if, if you have, if you, um, are driving down the road and in, in that scenario I painted earlier where you have the lights following you and it's 706 in the evening and suddenly the next thing you know you're 10 miles further down the road and it's 806 you've missed it you, you're missing an hour that's missing time time dilation is different time dilation is a warping of space time to where the passage of time the conscious passion passing of time is is warped is different um and and that all makes sense that's again that that's not supernaturalism that we these are concepts that are well known um in physics and are, at least in theoretical physics certainly uh, in einsteinian physics and that's not to say that everything that the greys do or that the the full extent of their technology is understood not by a long shot not by a long shot but but we can at least understand uh some of the principles behind what's happening some of the 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 physics behind what's happening so um if an abductee uh is if the if the craft if 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 the ufo the saucer usually is not in proximity to the abductee. In other words, it's landed in a field across the street. Then the grace come and they guide you through your house. And sometimes they levitate you through the house. But, but, but I think actually, let me back up. I think that only happens when the craft is in proximity. If the craft is not in proximity, the grays grab you by the hand and they guide you through the house, like little children, basically, like your little five or six year old grabbing you by the hand and leading you through your house, down the stairs, 
through the kitchen, out the front door, through the yard, across the street, you know, through the woods and into the field where the craft has landed. And oftentimes that happens when there's a mass abduction occurring where multiple people are taken from the same neighborhood at the same time. And the greys are dispatched to different houses in the neighborhood and, and brought on board the craft. Um, and so the, the, the aircraft, the, the aerospace craft that the greys are using is equipped with technology that uh, can only de be deployed at close range as it pertains to retrieving abductees. And what that range is, I have no idea. I mean, you know, who knows how close that is, but, but it's not across the street in the field because those cases always involve abductees being escorted out of their homes. And sometimes, you know, abductees from the same neighborhood see each other being abducted and remember, remember that that, that, that ha happened and talk to each other later about the event. Uh, screen memories are not foolproof. Uh, it, it, they, they don't work all the time. Uh, sometimes abductees have conscious memories or, or uh, you can't remember what happened until you run into your neighbor um, at, the, uh, at the supermarket. And then suddenly when you see their face, a flood of memories comes to both your mind and their mind about, hey, I saw you on the, on the saucer with the little gray people. Um, and uh, so th these are common occurrences, by the way. These are not one-offs in the in the abduction chronicles these are very common occurrences these are these are things that happen to people Is all there... over the world that things that are described with the exact same detail and have been described in the exact same detail for decades is decades there, is there characteristics to an abductee or is it random no it's not random uh ab abductions are hereditary they they abduct family lines and um What's what the are they looking for that? Yeah. are they looking for some kind of um a genetic marker some kind of a genetic trait that this family line has that is useful to the to the grays to the aliens in their in their um hybridization program or whatever else they're doing um i think that's possible in fact I, I postulate in my book, in, in my book, Birthright, where I talk about this extem extensively in my book, Birthright, I postulate in the book that I think one of the traits that the greys are looking for, and I could be wrong, this is just shooting from the hip. I don't have any way to prove this. One of the traits that the greys may be looking for is a heightened, um, let's call it, I hesitate to use this word because I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for it, but uh, a heightened psychic capacity in the abductee. And when I say that, what I mean specifically is telepathy. I believe that the human species is inherently telepathic. We are inherently empathic, that's for sure. Uh, telepathy is not telekinesis. It's not, you know, moving things around with your mind. It's, it's not mind control. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Telepathy is communication. That human beings inherently, when I say inherently, I'm talking about Adam and Eve, could communicate telepathically. I would go so far as to say that these entities, these beings that are designated as angels in the scriptures, um, in, uh, likely communicate primarily through telepathic means. How else did the burning uh, bush talk to Moses? There's no, and, and by the way, there's, th this is not, um, this is not some kind of a new age concept right. at all. Uh, you and I right now are not physically in the same room talking to one another. We're not, we're, we're hundreds and hundreds of miles away from one another. And yet we are having a communication through the agency of technology. Right. 
This would appear as telepathy to somebody from ages past. Um, but this is technology. So in the same way that you and I are able to communicate through the agency of technology, I think that human biology has the, has, has the equipment to be able to broadcast and receive uh, communications from other minds. Inherent. And when I say inherent, that means it's a God-given ability. It is built into the architecture of human biology. Now, for whatever reason, perhaps because of the fall, um, because of genetic degeneration, we have lost the ability to communicate in that fashion. Or maybe, maybe the ability was purposely disabled to some extent deactivated for our protection, perhaps, um, we definitely have the ability to receive telepathic communication. Um, the abduction phenomena bears this out. The abductions always involve telepathy because the greys, that's how they communicate with each other and with the abductees. They don't move their mouths. Their mouths do not move. Their mouths are little slits. They do not move. They do not have lips. And so they communicate telepathically, exclusively telepathically. So it, it, my theory is that human beings have, have, we have the equipment, but it's broken. We can still receive telepathic communications and perhaps even broadcast telepathic communications, but we can no longer tune the broadcast. We cannot, it's like a radio. You have the radio is picking up various signals, but it, it doesn't, it's just fuzz until you tune the radio to a particular channel. And then you get information. Otherwise, you just get background noise. So in order to receive the information, you have to be able to tune the radio. And I believe that we have lost our ability to tune the radio, so to speak. But some people um, can, like with the CIA's project for uh, remote viewing, remote viewing, psychers, uh, the men who stare at goats. You know, I have another theory on the abductee now that you said genealogy. If there is a hybridization program within what the greys are doing or within the, uh, the abductors are doing to the abductees, if you base it off of genealogy, let's say three to four generations down, or, you know, let's even say this person was abducted, uh, and then the seed of this person, which was mixed with an alien, is implanted into this woman. What does the baby come out as? And can the baby now, is it sterilized or can it reproduce? Because that would be interesting if you wanted to come back as a scientific journey. If I took these chromosomes and these chromosomes and inserted an alien artifact to it, which means something that's not uh original to those chromosomes the artifact will i you know will i get something uh different that can reproduce you know that's if you if you breed a mule uh to a horse or excuse me if you breed a donkey to a horse you're going to get a mule but the mule's sterile so it can't reproduce so is that something also similar that they could be looking for it could be i mean nobody really knows what they're looking for but one of the important things for the grays because the grays are diminutive they're small uh they don't have a whole lot of they don't have a whole lot of uh, 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 uh physical um they're not muscular let's put it that way they're very spindly and and other than their extremely powerful minds they're not particularly powerful creatures, physically speaking. And so it's very important for the greys that they are able to manipulate and control the abductee. And not just with the technology, with their own telepathic capabilities. All the greys have the, this capability. The greys, for example, usually at the onset, onset of an abduction will, will look the abductee in the face with, the, with their big black almond-shaped eyes, and, and we'll try and calm the abductee down and communicate to the abductee, we're not going to hurt you. Um, don't panic. Don't be afraid. Um, so it's and, like a commun uh, communion. 
Yeah, so, so they're, they're trying to to console, uh, or at the very least, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? They're, they're attempting to uh, calm the abductee down, and and it works. It works in almost every case. Like Not always, pa- but like pa- it usually of works. Persuasion. It's yeah, it's beyond that. It's some kind of yeah. they tap into your psyche and and whatever that means. I mean, we don't even understand really understand the brain yet, but there's some kind of a mechanism that's in play here. Again, it's not supernaturalism. We're talking about an innate ability, telepathic communication. It's very much like um, empathy or the the um, not empathy, um, the the. The ability that human beings naturally have to be empathic. And what I mean by empathic is we can pick up on each other's feelings. And not just based on our body language. We can feel each other's feelings on a very, on a very deep level. Um, and animals can do this as well. Animals, a lot of times, like dogs, sometimes will know when their when their um, when their owners are 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 sick or depressed. It's empathic. So humans are definitely empathic. There's no question about it. We are definitely, and so are anim- and so are uh, higher conscious animals are empathic. This is beyond empathic. This is telepathic. And so. Uh, this is extremely important to the operation, to the greys performing their operations, to retrieving abductees. What I was trying to say earlier, and the word was escaping me, was that the greys, when they look into your eyes, what they're trying to do is they're trying to induce, um, they're trying to make you docile. Uh, that's that's really, I think, the, the more accurate word than console. Console is not the right word. They're 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 making you docile. That's 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 what they're doing, uh, so that you become compliant. Now they have the technology to make you compliant, but but if they need to walk you through the house across the street, then they have to make sure that you're docile. And implants probably play a role in this as well. Um, but we know that the greys do this telepathically, at least in part, because when people get rowdy, and that's, this happens in abductions, people start to fight back and, and get rowdy. Usually what follows is one of the beings, and not always the little guys, sometimes the bigger guys, which are more powerfully telepathic, the, the insectiline ones. Um, they, will, they will look you right in the face. They'll, they will... They will um, direct focus their gaze right at you and connect with you telepathically to calm you down so this is biological something biological going on here connection that's being made between the alien and the abductee and so because this is such an important facet such an important component for the grace of the abduction process the procedure um I believe they're they're looking to identify people who are. I'm trying to think of the correct terminology here. Uh, people who are more prone, let's say, to psychic manip- manipulation, um, so that they can be more easily managed, and that might have something to do with DNA. Um, and so. And, and one of the reasons why I draw this conclusion, what, why I have formulated this theory, is because there is a direct connection between abductees and psychics. And what I mean by that is, I believe that the greys use psychics, and I'm talking about your neighborhood psychic, you know, the, the, the psychic parlor down the road from you, if you have one, in your neighborhood. They use psychics to identify potential abductees. Abductees who have this proclivity 
to be psychically manipulated, telepathically manipulated. Okay, stop, and, right, uh, stop right there because you, you just crossed into something that not only is crazy, uh, but I guess for me, I'm kind of skeptical about a lot of the psychics because God, I've met too many of them. Uh, who've introduced themselves to me while in the performance of my duties. But with what you're talking about now, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take this away, Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer and his SETI Institute will all sit around and get into a mantra and hum themselves into connection with a being or with a craft and it will manifest. Uh, I, I don't that's know. That's a whole other conversation. I, I, I don't know that I trust the validity of some of those accounts and experiences. Um, so that, that's a whole other topic. But as it pertains to psychics, I'm not verifying the abilities of those psychics i'm not saying that those psychics are these are 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 not you know the usual sort of hucksterish people that they tend to be what i'm saying is that many of those psychics psychics and we can say quote unquote psychics because who knows what's really at work um if they do have real abilities um Many of those individuals are themselves, in fact, I would probably go so far as to say most of them, are themselves abductees. And so what it's like is it's like using those people as nodes, like radio towers. And so when individuals come in to get a psychic reading, then they connect somehow with these psychics on a psychic level. And we are all connected to some degree on that level, to some degree. But you're saying people and, that are coming there are, are connecting with them almost like if they're creating a dossier. Exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. And then the, then the, the greys can then identify potential abductees based on their contact with these psychics who happen to be abductees. And the psychics don't know that this is happening, but the greys are using them for this purpose. And... Um, now, you know, it's kind of a can of worms even talking about this because, because a lot of people will have the knee jerk reaction to accuse me of being new age or something like that. I have nothing to do whatsoever with the new age community. I am not a new age person. I, I, I adhere, I believe in the gospel of Christ. I'm not a, a, a person who subscribes to any kind of new age theology. Um, however, I do believe, as I said, that Adam and Eve were inherently telepathic. They had the built-in capacity. It was, it was built into the architecture of their biology and is likely still built into the architecture of our, our biology. This, this capability to communicate without words, to communicate with thoughts. So, um, and the greys take advantage of this. And so long story short, to summarize all of that, the greys, in my estimation, part of what they're trying to identify in potential abductees is this proclivity, this inclination, this genetic trademark that makes people open to telepathic manipulation, psychic manipulation, um, so that they can be effectively incorporated into the program, the abduction program. Um, it would be like us if we were if we were looking um, if we had a circus and this is a very crude example. it's the one that popped into my mind for some reason. If you and I had a circus and we were out in the Serengeti looking for animals to capture and bring into our circus to train and to control, and to manipulate, we might be looking for animals that were more docile, easier to control, animals that seem to be less aggressive, because obviously those animals will be easy to, easier to train and control. And in, in, in the same way, the greys are likely looking for that in their 
potential abductees because everything depends on the gray's ability to keep the abductees under control. And there are sometimes hundreds of abductees on the same ship uh, being manipulated by the grays. I spoke to one abductee who recounted, uh, this is a common, this is, this is not uncommon um, among abductees to recount a scenario like this. Uh, she told me about a scenario in which she remembers, uh, she has this acute memory of, of laying on a table, naked on a table, with, with, surrounded by hundreds of other abductees naked on tables of all ages. And and in a, in a large room and like a and like a you know a, a a gymnasium or something like that, but on board the on board the craft, a very large um, craft. And and she told me she remembers distinctly on one occasion where she, where she sort of came out of her UFO brain fog, as LA says, um, that the 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 Greys were losing control. They were losing this this telepathic manipulation because the people were sort of trying to rouse each other and waking up, and there was a bit of a riot breaking out, a little insurrection happening on that uh, craft, and the people were starting to panic and freak out, and the Greys uh, had to get them under control. Uh, if you if you were to break free momentarily from this 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 telepathic manipulation and and punch a gray alien in the face you're a much bigger being you're much you're a much larger creature than than these little grays you you could do some serious damage so these these little aliens are trying to you know it'd be like us Again, let's go back to the circus analogy. It'd be like us sedating a hundred gorillas and and bringing them into the into the tent or whatever the circus and working with them, and then suddenly all of the gorillas are starting to wake up. It'd be like us trying to physically manhandle these gorillas to get them under c- control. It would be impossible. They would rip us to shreds unless we could tap in telepathically and render them docile. Through this other means, and that's and that's what the Greys do, and they have to be able to. They this has to work. It has to work in order for the operation to succeed. Um, and and that again, it's not as crazy as it sounds. It's not uncommon. It's not an uncommon story in the chronicles of 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 abductees. People fight back sometimes. They have to be subdued. Most often, they're subdued through the telepathic communication. Through that, through that psychic connection, uh, manipulation that the Greys have over them, I'm sure the Greys also employ technology if they have to, to to subdue people, um, and so uh, that's a very very important part of the of the program, let's say, and and uh, and so that's why I believe that again, to summarize my theory, that's why I believe that they're looking for this this telepathic trait, this, and there's a word I'm looking for here that I use in my book. There's a way I describe this that is escaping me. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble today uh, uh, holding on to some of these words that, that are fluttering through my brain, but, but there, there's a way I describe it. It's not necessarily having a proclivity towards this psychic capacity. There's a different way to explain it. It's more of a genetic um, trait that they're looking for um, that's the best I can explain it at this point well, they're looking for people who have a I guess you could say a heretical psychic link a genetic predisposition that they can tap into that's the word I was looking for my god it just popped into my head all of a, a genetic predisposition which means that 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 this psychic faculty is 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 more activated in these people than in the rest of the population. But why? 
What's you the know, it's 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 le- let's put it this way. It's less broken uh, well, in this genetic family line uh, than in the rest of the uh, than than in than in other humans. So well, there's a there's a genetic disposition um, that the Greys I think are trying to identify. Besides besides just the abduction, the experimentation. What's the need to hold on to that person? Because many of these victims are victims for years, several years to even decades from what I what we've researched and what we know about the abducted uh, the abduction phenomena. So it's never just one time. Once they no, no, made, no, it's, once they made that link, it keeps it keeps happening. What's the need for that? What's what because we have uh, five minutes left, what's the end goal? Is it to create the ability for that person to be like a liaison eventually for the greys? Is it no? Just- they're they're no they're they're producing hybrids. So so abductees are abducted from the time that they're toddlers all the way to who knows how old. Definitely elderly people are being abducted. We know that elderly people are still being abducted. So an abductee will say, you know what? I was abducted. I can recall three. I was abducted three times and then it stopped for whatever reason. No, it didn't. The fact is that no, it did not. Once an abductee, always an abductee. I have encountered no exceptions to that rule. Once an abductee, always an abductee. You are what once you have been chosen to be in the program, you are in your it's it's basically cradle to grave. That's a harsh reality, but it is not nevertheless a reality. It's it's hereditary and it's and it is over the course of your entire life. Now, you're re, you are consciously able to recall a handful of those abductions, but you might have been abducted a hundred times and you can only recall three of them. Um, and people do this. Sometimes people suppress their own memories because of trauma. Right. How can you live and function normally in the world knowing that at any moment um, you can be visited by the greys and taken. I mean, you can, and some people do. Some people do. Um, but for a lot of people, that's just, that's just far too tra- traumatic. And so what they do is they sequester those memories. They do themselves. This is, this is aside from the screen memories. Because this is such a traumatic thing, they will, they will sequester those memories into a different part of their mind, of their psyche, and, and hold them there. And so maybe they remember a few of those memories and they can deal with remembering a few of those memories, but they can't deal with the preponderance of those memories. Is, the, is, is there a overall outcome for these abductees to uh, form a state of psychosis or to have marital breakdowns, relationship problems, a overall individual? I don't know about that. Breakdown? I don't know about that. You could probably reference the work of Dr. John Mack. Um, who was uh, the head of, psych- of the Department of, Psychiatry-, of Psychiatry at Harvard University, um, who also happened to be one of the premier abduction researchers. But um, I do know that abductees do have stress. They have post-traumatic stress. Um, you know, they have, I call it post-abduction stress. They have post-abduction stress. And uh, and so they may not know why they're so stressed out or why they wake up in the morning feeling like, you know, somebody, somebody was, was punching them in the face all night. Or, you know, so they, they, they were in a wrestling match while they were sleeping and they wake up stressed out with marks on their body, sometimes scratches, sometimes scoop marks, sometimes triangular delta shaped uh, uh, markings on their body. Um, and, and, that's, and that causes, you know, there's also a lack of sleep involved if you're an abductee. If you're missing two hours of sleep during the night and those two hours were pretty traumatic, you're, you're going to feel pretty crappy in the morning when you wake up. And so there's stress that is associated with that that, that abductees have. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you are a person who deals with a lot of stress and you don't sleep well, that, that you are an abductee. That's, that's not uh, a... That's that. It, that's not the the automatic correlation there. Um, it's just it just happens that a lot of abductees are, are dealing with that. 
again, because they're literally physically on board a craft for an hour or two hours or three hours during the night. Not every night. I mean, abductions don't happen every night. Damn, we got um, we got one minute left. As usual, it, it takes the fifty five minute for us to really get into that next level of the conversation. Uh, let's see if we can do a part three because uh, once again, we're really starting to cover some ground here. And uh, before we go, let everyone know where they can find all your great information. Well, they can uh, they can find me on YouTube. My channel is Timothy Alberino. I've got all kinds of videos on there. Um, they can read my book, Birthright. You can get my book on Amazon.com, um, where I talk about this extensively in my book, among a lot of other things, other topics. Bam, um, right there, Birthright. There it is. And I also have a conference coming up in May, in uh, from the 6th through the 7th of May in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, you can get your tickets for the conference at birthrightconference.com. $40 off right now. The general admission, uh, use promo code BRANDON, all caps. Oh, let's go, Brandon. <laughs> well, Tim, man, this has been fun. This has been good. We're uh, we're going to do a, a part three of this, and we're going to see how much deeper into this conversation we can get. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim, thank you very much for being here. I know we all appreciate it. We, we'd love to hear it whenever you uh, you opine about these subjects. So uh, thank you for, for blessing us with this knowledge. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name's uh, Doug Fortin. This is Timothy Alberino. You've been listening to the American Vindictive Show. We're out of here. Thank you. <laughs>